Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Calder. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today and to understanding the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in the way that God has revealed for us to understand it. Now, we're looking at the ancient history of America and Britain. And how is it that we became the nations that beginning with the British Empire and then America becoming an individual nation that between us we ruled the world for nearly 500 years. The British Empire ruled the world. It was, in fact, the largest empire to exist at any point throughout history. Reaching across the globe and carrying on over multiple centuries, the British Empire owes its success and ability to expand so widely. The geographical position of Great Britain served as a major advantage to the growing empire. Given that the nation was an island, the likelihood of being invaded or conquered was somewhat lower than a country that was surrounded on all sides by foreign powers. The Brits were able to sail to just about any coastal nation without much resistance. Still, oceanic adventures would not have been so effortless for the British Empire without a strong naval fleet. This is where the size and power of the Royal Navy became a center point of British success. The British Empire began to establish a commercial system that allowed for exponential success within Great Britain and its overseas territories. Colonies were granted monopolies for their products in the British market, and therefore were to conduct trade via British ships. In 1651, the Navigation Act would prompt the development of a closed economy between the empire and its colonies thus creating a system where all colonial imports were required to come from Great Britain and all colonial exports were to be sent directly to the British market by the way of British ships. During the same century, the British East India Company was established as a means of trade between Great Britain, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and India. Initially focused on the spice trade, the East India Company later incorporated other goods such as silk, cotton, tea, opium, and more. Politics made its way into the company later on, despite the origin being purely based on establishing more trade opportunities. Driven limitlessly by the concept of controlling a global trade market, the British Empire continued to extend its reach across the continents of Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and the Americas. Great Britain was ultimately awarded most of northeastern Africa and all of southern Africa, meaning that at its peak in the continent, the British Empire ruled over approximately 30% of the African population. Globally, at the height of Britain's domination, it controlled roughly 22 to 25 percent of the world's land surface, and by 1938, governed around 20 percent of the world's population. This remarkable prosperity was accomplished through a geographical advantage, supreme naval might, and the strategic focus on trade and wealth over bullish sovereign power for the sake of an emperor. The modern United States is the most powerful country in human history, with over 800 military bases and 37% of global military spending. The U.S. has become the leader of a vast interconnected global system that has helped usher in an era of unprecedented prosperity and low levels of conflict. And how is it that we became the people to spread the Bible and the Word of God into the whole world? and to be responsible for translating the Bible into nearly 500 languages, the New Testament into over 2,500 languages. And the Gospel of Mark was written in such a way that it was easily translatable into many different languages. 
and we were responsible for doing it mainly. There were the Bible societies of France and other Bible societies which added to it. But why didn't it come out of China? Why didn't it come out of Russia? Why didn't it come out of Spain? A lot of people think that it came out of the Roman Catholic Church, but it didn't. So the history of this is very important. So let's go back and see the promise to Abraham of being the father of many nations. Come back here to Genesis 17, verse 9. Now, as I explained, a covenant is different than a testimony. A covenant, you make your pledge, and then you give evidence that you will do it, which is a sacrificial offering. And in this case, God, in Genesis 15, walked through the parts of the animals to show he would make it irrevocable. He would keep his word. And there's no going back on it, and there's no changing it. So now we see there are two parts to it, one down to Christ, and two to the physical nations that would come from Abraham. So let's read it. Verse 9, And God said to Abraham, You shall keep my covenant, you and your seed after you and their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, for it shall be a sign of of my covenant between me and you, and that is a physical descendants or seed. Now let's see what else happened. Let's see the requirement of it, you see. A lot of people think that circumcision is of the Jews. No, Jesus said circumcision is of the fathers. And who is the first father? Abraham and then Isaac, and then Jacob, right? We'll see that. Verse 12, And a son of eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every male child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with silver of any foreigner who is not of your seed. He that is born in your house and he that is bought with your silver must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now, that's something. Now, what are a lot of the doctors doing today? They're saying, oh, you don't need to circumcise your male children. Huh. They don't even know why it was practiced the way it was in the first place and goes clear back to here. Now, let's notice something else that all the nations of the Arabs are also the nations of Abraham through Ishmael. And Ishmael was the son of Hagar, the handmaid of Sarah, because Sarah made the mistake of thinking that since she wasn't able to bear children at that time, that it would be allowable for Abraham to raise up children from Hagar. And that turned out to be a mistake because God said to Abraham, his covenant, his promise, which couldn't be broken, would be through Sarah, his wife, not Hagar. But notice how important that circumcision is. And the uncircumcised male who flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, she shall not be called Sarai, but her name shall be Sarah. And I will bless her and give her a son also. Yes, I will bless her 
and she shall be a mother of nations. Now listen carefully. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, those are fantastic blessings. And remember that God will carry out his word. Verse 17, And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, How shall a child be born to him who is a hundred years old? And how shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. No. God wasn't going to do it that way. Verse 19, And God said, Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son indeed, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And he said, I heard your prayer for Ishmael. He will be fruitful and multiply and become a great nation. Verse 21, But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at the set time in the next year. Well, that was quite a thing. So then, all the circumcision of the males took place in Abraham's household. Now, let's come to Genesis 18. These things are here so we know who we have come from, what people we are, and what is the obligation to us with the Word of God? Now, I want you to think on that. It's no accident. It's by deliberation. So what are we going to do? Now, let's go back and see the history of how Isaac came to be. Genesis 18, verse 1, And the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat at the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. Now that was the Lord God and two angels. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed down himself toward the ground. And he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, do not pass away, I pray, from your servant. Then the three men stayed there, and Sarah prepared a meal, and then they asked him, verse 9, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it at the tent door which was behind him, now, Abram and Sarah were old, well advanced in days, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? Now remember one thing that's important. Nothing is impossible for God. Now God did it this way so that they would know and the rest of the world would know down through all time that God made this happen. A 90-year-old woman to bear a son and a 100-year-old man to become a father to show that this had to be of God. Not something that men have done, not something that men have cooked up, not fabulous fables that come from the imagination of men. Verse 13, And the Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I, who am old, truly bear a child? Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, nothing because he made the heavens and the earth and created everything that there is and all human beings on the earth and everything that has life on the earth and in the ocean and under the ocean and under the land all came from God.
Then he continued, At the appointed time I will return again according to the time of life, and Sarah shall bear a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid, and he said, No, but you did laugh. Then what follows is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now let's continue on and come to Genesis 21. Genesis 21, because God's word is true and he will fulfill it. So he said to Sarah, you shall bear a son, and she did. Verse 1, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time. At the set time. God does everything according to his timetable as kept by the calculated Hebrew calendar. One of the main set times is the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And then all of his holy days are appointed set times. Now, he didn't give those just for rituals. Now, you get our series on the Sabbath day, and you download those and watch them, and get our booklet on the Sabbath, Sabbath or Sunday, which day is the Lord's day? And we have a big, thick book, so if you get it, you better be prepared to see everything you've ever thought about Christianity is not true. And that book is called God's Plan Revealed by His Sabbath and Holy Days. You better be in for a long-term study with that because this is not a skim-the-surface, fly-by-night little pamphlet it is a big, thick book, over a thousand pages. So if you're serious, you write for it, we'll send it to you at no cost. Now, back to Genesis 21. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. And this is quite an amazing thing, how the covenant was passed on to Isaac. And Isaac, as we find in chapter 22, was much like a type of Christ. So let's see this. And let's see also that this ended up being the sacrifice of Abraham to confirm his faith and belief in God and the promises that he had given for, number one, Christ the Messiah, and number two, the many nations that would come from his offspring. And the first one was Isaac. So here's what God told him. He said, take your son, your only son. Now Ishmael was not the son of promise. So Isaac was his only son. And take him to sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of Moriah. And so that was a three-day journey to get there. Now when they got there, let's come to verse 5. And Abraham said to the young men who were there with him on the journey, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go yonder and worship and come to you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, a type of Christ carrying his own cross. And he took the fire pot in his hand and a knife, and they both went together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, you see, 
Sometimes God tests us down to the last minute. Do we believe God? And why would Abraham do that? In any movie that you ever saw about this, they show that Abraham was angry at God for asking that. But that wasn't true because Hebrews 11 shows that Abraham did it because he knew God could raise him from the dead. Now, notice his answer. And Abraham said, verse 8, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went on together. So they came to the place. He built the altar with the rocks, laid the wood on it, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the wood upon the altar. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Then God intervened. And this was a confirmation of the faith of Abraham and God's promise. Now let's see what happened with that. And let's see how God firmly established that covenant, as I have said, down to Christ and all the nations that would come of the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Do not lay your hand upon the lad, nor do anything to him. I want you to think on this, what he said. For now, I know. Well, how long had he known Abraham? Well, here, this has got to be 40 years he knew Abraham. And look at what he said. Now. I know. Now, what about you? What's your relationship with God? What do you think about what you need to do, how you need to do it? All right? God is not bringing this same trial upon you, but he expects the same faith and belief that Abraham had. Now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So, this is also New Testament doctrine, isn't it? We are to love God more than father or mother, brother or sister, or any other relative or any other thing. We're to love God more. And love means to keep and obey and serve. It's not just a little 30-second fly-by-night twiddly-dee asking God to forgive your sins. That is a futile prayer, and God will never hear that unless you have the repentance that you get on your knees before God and you confess your sins to Him. And then, when you get up off your knees, you better quit sinning. And then you need to Go to our section that we have on baptism and see what you need to do to get right with God. Now back here to Genesis 22, verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram was entangled in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now notice, Abraham called the name of the place The Lord will provide. Now think about all the factors involved up to that time and point. So that it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Now notice the promise coming. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn. Now think of that. That's the highest proof that it will happen. 
because God is there to carry it out. And he said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying I will multiply your seed like the stars of heaven. And that is all the spiritual sons and daughters of God through Christ being resurrected from the dead to shine as the stars of heaven. And as the stand which is upon the seashore, the physical nations of Israel, of which you have in this book America and Britain, their biblical origin and their prophetic destiny that gives the whole history of the 12 tribes of Israel, not just the Jews. The Jews like to claim everything for their own, but that's not true. They are not the 12 tribes, and the throne of David still exists today, and the Jews do not have it. So next time, we'll find out where is the throne of David and who sits on it and how did it get where it is. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home. And this is Fred Coulter saying so long, everyone.